Great. Hello, dear friends. It's Carly, and welcome to this space where here in this present moment, it is a very rainy morning here in Kansas, and I am delighted to be here. There's nowhere I would rather be than uh, to create this bubble of awareness uh, for you here, wherever you are in your now moment. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my, my practice, my website, everything is owning authenticity. And that is a very personal mission for me. This is kind of the basis of how I practice and how I live my life and try to live from a place of what my soul came forward to do. Uh, so if any of that resonates, I invite you to stick around for this video, check out other videos, subscribe, be notified for new content. Uh, I welcome you. I welcome you wherever it feels right for you to join in this practice of owning authenticity. You're in the right spot. So I want to introduce you to a couple of the different things that I do before we dive into the topic uh, that we're here to cover today. The first is my podcast called I Learned. And it is a hodgepodge of all kinds of topics. Human design is one of them. I have several episodes on human design. I also talk a lot about lots of other things uh, related to emotion management and intuition and being an entrepreneur and on and on and on. There's all kinds of fun things on that podcast and really everything that centers around how do I practice my authenticity on a daily basis. So if that sounds good, check that out for sure. Anchor.fm slash I learned. I have another podcast as well. I love to talk if you couldn't tell. Uh, and it's called Astro Lessons. So the goal there is to do five to 15 minute episodes, little bites of astrological knowledge or knowledge about natal charts and mix that with my generally spiritual perspective. Um, everything connects. So yeah, like kind of drawing it out to the bigger picture themes that we see in astrology and our natal charts. So if that sounds interesting, anchor.fm slash and again, before we jump into the nine centers, which is what we're here to spend the bulk of this, this space around, I do want to spend just a minute touching base on this underlying theme of all of my work, especially um, the work that I'm doing in this space around self-awareness and self-love. I'm, I'm coming to this awareness of the art of studying self, and that is really passion behind what I do here on my YouTube channel, on my website, in my personal coaching sessions. Um, it is to find the most loving, most empowering perspective of ourselves, not to change who we are at all. It's a practice of study and understanding and acceptance. And hopefully through acceptance, love, self-love is the, the goal, I think, that I for sure am seeking, and maybe you are too. And if you are, you're, again, in the right place. Uh, this quote kind of underpins the whole, the whole theory, uh, give a man a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So that is why in this session, my goal is to skim the surface of a lot of information so that you have a basis of understanding of the framework of what we're looking for and are looking at in these human design charts. And then from there, you would have enough of a tool set to go and do your own research, uh, to go fish yourself, so to speak, um, and feed yourself for the rest of your life by learning different pieces of your own human design chart. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there charging you good money to teach you your human design. And I, I'm going to try to teach you, that's the goal of this session, how to do it yourself for free. And if you ever are interested in having someone walk you through it yourself um, or in an individual private session, I do offer that as well. So I sell these in packages of four sessions. And then every session is 90 minutes. It's all done on, online. Um, the scheduling is flexible seven days a week. Uh, and those four sessions would be used over two to three months to allow at least a couple weeks between each session to really digest what we're unearthing in each of those very jam-packed 90-minute sessions. So 
if that sounds like something that you want to do, or after you listen to this, you'd like some more help with your chart, um, I encourage you to reach out to me at owningauthenticity at gmail.com. And I will provide pricing that way. I left it out just in case as it changes over time. Uh, contact me there and you'll always get the most up-to-date pricing that I'm working with. So without further ado, human design, the nine centers, that is what we're here to talk about today. So the energy centers, as I, as I sat and just dove down the internet rabbit holes of human design, um, it happened on a Saturday. It took about nine hours for me to like really wrap my mind around it. And it was absolutely delicious. Um, I say I gleefully sacrificed those nine hours. I invested them into this knowledge so that I could do exactly what I'm doing right now, which is teaching other people how to understand it and how to do their own research um, so that they can get the empowerment that comes from understanding yourself on that deep of a level. So as I really dove into it, um, I'm fairly new to human design in general. That's why we're starting here at the beginning. Um, but as I dove into it, the very first thing that caught my attention were the energy centers and this idea of open centers, um, which is a lot what we're going to get into as we continue on here. And this is the bulk of what I want to talk about, these energy centers. But I also want to kind of spin this web of awareness around the energy centers and set them into context in the whole chart. There's a lot of different pieces going on that come together to tell us which centers are what and how our unique energy functions. So we're going to keep coming back to these nine centers, but we're also going to add in the bits of the foundation that we need to be able to understand them um, and understand the power of how that center functions for you. Really, however it's configured, there's power and wisdom and understanding and mastering your personal unique energy. So at this point, I'm going to say if you don't have your human design chart handy and right in front of you, pause this video and go and get your chart so that you can put it side by side with the video and really start pulling your own chart together as we go through each piece. Um, this is this link on the screen is one such uh, place that you can get your chart. I usually just Google human design chart, and I think this is the first place that comes up. So that's super easy. You do need your birth date, time, and location. So um, in doing natal chart readings for some time now, I know not everybody has their time of birth. And if you don't really, it's I don't know. It's you could guesstimate your time and pull your human design chart, but there's a lot of variables at play that really it does matter what time you were born to really be able to pull the most accurate chart for you. So keep that in mind as you work with it if you don't have your birth time. Okay, so assuming now that you have your chart and we're back on the video, um, what is human design? So zooming out to this bigger picture of why do we care about this? What is this chart? And what's the point? Um, the best way to sum it up that I found is it's the science of differentiation. And very simply, that is the idea that we are all unique, that we are all as unique as our thumbprint, our DNA, um, our energy fingerprint is unique to us. And this map, this human design chart, is a picture of how your circuitry is wired. Inside the human form, there is a set energetic circuitry that exists and we'll call that potential. And then based on the energy they imprinted on you when you were born, you have a certain energetic fingerprint. You have a defined set of how you flow energy through your system. And so this, this human design chart is basically a diagram of your unique circuitry. So because it's assuming right from the start that this is unique, this is a very powerful tool for self-mastery, for self-understanding and understanding patterns that have existed in your whole life. Like this isn't gonna be probably new information. When you start reading about your human design chart, it's gonna be like reading about the life you've lived thus far. And if anything, giving you a helpful context to kind of put the pieces together around 
why are you living the patterns that you're living? And if you're not enjoying those patterns, then what are some tools to help you work with the way your energy is wired to help you live something that you'll enjoy more? So very, very powerful. And when we say like, how much are you enjoying your life? It's a question of your average mood, your average being like, you know, average 365 days, that's a year, like put all of those daily moods together. And that's your average enjoyment of your life. So how is it? Could it be better? Probably. I mean, who's couldn't. Um, and so this is a tool for moving towards a better existence for you personally. Um, yeah, human design really like just explodes this idea that there is such thing as a cookie cutter life. There's no recipe that any of us can follow other than the feeling of our own individual energetic circuitry. So this is a, a means to an end to understand how we're wired as individuals. So in that web of understanding how we're wired, what do our energy centers tell us? Um, two concepts exist here in this space of energy centers. The first is conditioning. So that's a word that you'll read a lot when you start reading stuff about human design. And it's a very important idea and something to be aware of. And in the earlier parts of our lives, we, I mean, we come in as very impressionable. We come in as this blank slate and our identity somewhat, um, gets written onto us by the environment that we live in when we're small. And so that's conditioning, that, that taking on and soaking up and embodying the beliefs and the ways of being of the people around you. And so that, it, it doesn't have to be inherently bad. You know, like when you take stuff in, you may be exposed to something that really does work for you and you want to keep that because you really like it. You know, this person, you witnessed it in them. You really like it. You want it for yourself. Great. Hang on to that. That's cool. I'm talking about things that like you do it because your dad did it. But when you do it, it doesn't really feel good. But like he did it and you don't want him to think that you're not like cool. Like he like it's like that, like when it doesn't feel good to you personally that's conditioning in a negative form, you know, where we're denying ourselves then in favor of being like those that we're sharing an environment with, like our parents or our friends or lots of different ways, basically anywhere you go, that your energy can be influenced or conditioned. And as a result of conditioning, we wind up with not self behavior. And this is another concept in human design in general, that basically these are the rumble strips on the highway. So when you're experiencing your not self behavior, which basically just means you're whacked out and you're not, you don't feel good and you're not acting good and you don't like the way you're acting, but maybe you don't even know how to change the way you're acting. Um, not self, <laughs> right? You're out of control. Been there, been there, done that many times. Um, like when we're burnt out, when we start getting snappy at other people because we've lost our patience because we let ourselves get all run down and stuff because we pushed ourselves too hard because we didn't know when enough was enough. And now we're overwhelmed. We're exhausted. We're, we are not our best self, not self. Um, and basically it's how we're behaving when we are out of sync with who we truly are. When you are being overly conditioned and you're acting in a way that you think is in alignment with your conditioning, but it opposes your true self, that is where not self behavior is generated from. So when you're in your not self behavior, it's helpful to understand that I feel this way because I'm following somebody else's compass. If I were following my own internal compass, I would feel better right now. So maybe let me turn inward. Let me take some alone time. Let me go into my journal and explore my thoughts or talk to a trusted friend or therapist or life coach or whatever and figure out like, what is your internal compass? Because when we're living from that, we're living from our authentic self. That's the opposite of conditioning. And that is our, our authentic self is our real self. And that's where we want to be coming from in our lives in order to achieve the greatest happiness. Is it required to live from your authentic self? No. And a lot of people don't. And that's cool. It's not required at all, but it's the source of happiness and well being and abundance, as we'll see later, foreshadowing for what's to come. 
So there is another concept. This is really where we're getting a little bit deeper into energy centers. And what really caught my eye was this difference between having a defined energy center or an open or undefined energy center. And so just so we're clear, the energy centers are these shapes, the triangle, square, the diamond, the little triangle, all of these shapes are the nine energy centers. And if the energy center is colored in, meaning it's a color, whatever color it is, um, that means it's defined. And we're gonna get into how does something get defined here just a little bit later. If it's white or clear, it's open. So it's not actually white, it is clear, it's empty. And that is where conditioning happens. Anywhere you have an open center in your chart, that is where you're taking on the energy from the, the environment. And the more centers you have open, the more sensitive you are to the, the energy of your environment. So it's a source of being pulled away from your authentic self because you have this risk of absorbing the identities and the thoughts and the energies of other people and the wisdom, the source of unique brilliance that comes with these open centers is to learn how to distinguish what's mine and what am I picking up from other people. And if it's something that I've picked up from other people, is it something that I want to keep or is it something that I want to let go of? And then if it's something you want to let go of, you let go of it. So with those open centers, it's so important to be aware of the hygiene of those centers and make sure that they're not holding on to things that don't even belong to you that are blocking the flows of your energy. Um, the wisdom that comes with our open centers is that we basically learn to let go. There's a lot of trust and in that trust wisdom that comes from living with these open centers and having to master that energy before it's mastered, it feels very chaotic. Typically our open centers would be the source of depression and anxiety. And like when you have those centers open, it's basically an inconsistent source of energy because you are not producing it yourself. In the defined centers, you're generating your own energy. In the open centers, you're taking it on from your environment. So in alone time, for example, nobody else in your house, just you, you're not taking on any energy from anybody else. And in that moment, it can feel really uncomfortable if you're out of whack with your open centers, because now, like, for example, like, let's say the identity center is open. Like in this picture, it's defined because it's colored in. But if it were open in alone time, you feel like you don't know who you are. You have a total lack of sense of self because you're no longer taking in energy that fuels your identity you're all by yourself and you don't produce identity energy naturally. So that is part of the anxiety and the potential depression and unhappiness that can come from those open centers. But learning to master them is our, our path to our own brilliance and wisdom. So you can also, this is just another example to kind of pull them apart and like, how do they really function? Those, those, um, so it's like a, a sponge versus a glass paperweight and you put them both into water and the sponge is obviously going to take on the water from its environment. The glass paperweight is going to sink straight to the bottom and will not absorb water. And that's the difference between a defined center and an open center. So it's, it's not good or bad. There isn't a right way or a wrong way. It's a matter of understanding how your unique energy functions. And if you are a sponge, it's important to wring that sponge out every once in a while, like every day, you know, like empty it back out on purpose so that you can be aware of like, what's yours and what did you pick up from somebody else that maybe doesn't even have anything to do with your life. So it's, it's not good or bad. It's just a matter of understanding and studying the art of studying ourselves. Okay, so back to just a little bit of foundation before we continue into the deep dives. Um, so the human design types, when you look at your, your human design chart, the printout, uh, up at the top, the very first thing it tells you is what type you are. And you see that 66% of everybody are generators, and that includes 
manifesting generators. So if you if it says either one of those generator or manifesting generator, that's both in the generator category because what makes a generator is this, this sacral center being defined. So if you have your sacral center defined, meaning it's colored in on your chart, and we're going to get into which one's a sacral, um, we're going to cover all that. Just know that that means, and actually it's this one right here, it's this little red one, which is the second square from the bottom. So if that's defined, then you're a generator. That's what makes you a generator. And if your throat is also defined, that's what makes you a manifesting generator. So just plain generators, they have a sacral defined and not the throat. So the everybody else doesn't have their sacral defined. So you see that 66% of people have it defined and the other third doesn't. So out of that other third, there's three different types. Uh, projectors are another 22%. And that means that they don't have a defined sacral center and they also don't have a defined throat center. And that means that they're a non-energy type. Like they, they don't generate energy, they don't manifest themselves, they they project their energy. I I projector is like the hardest one for me to understand. So I'm gonna just like leave it at that. And um yeah, we'll we'll do a more in-depth video just on the four types and like really diving deep into those types and the strategies for each of them. Um, but I do know definition is no sacral, no throat. And then manifestors, um, 9%, 10%, uh, they don't have the sacral defined and they have their throat defined. So that's the difference between a projector and a manifestor is the de definition of the throat. And then a reflector, which you see it's only 1%. I would love to meet a reflector in person. I think it would be so cool. Basically, they have all of their centers open. So I googled famous reflectors and Sandra Bullock is like one of the main ones that came up and there were articles written about like how she uses her reflectorness to like step into the roles, the characters that she plays um, and that she like literally embodies that persona um, like she becomes a different person. And just like any open center, you know, just because they have them all open, basically it can be extremely chaotic when you're young. And as you learn to master it, it's like a buffet where every single center is open, meaning you have access to taste anything on the buffet that you want. With any of your open centers, like you get to try on lots of different energies and mindsets and personas and lots of different stress levels and on and on and on. And that the beauty of that is as you learn discernment, as you grow in your self-awareness, in your true authentic identity, we are able to keep the pieces that really resonate with who we truly are and let go of the ones that aren't for us, that those don't fit with who we truly are. We picked it up from somebody along our path. We tried it on. Uh, it kind of itches me in the weird spot. So I'm going to take it back off and just leave it there. You don't have to wear around something that doesn't feel good. And that's really the wisdom of those open centers is to set down the stuff that doesn't feel good. But we're going to get more into all of that. So the body graph, it shows our cosmic signature is another way that I've seen it put. And that is like our unique circuitry. The body graph is the picture that's like at the very center of your chart, the crazy picture that has everything on it. And we're going to break it all down. Um, and there's actually a full body graph and a simplified body graph. And what you have in front of you, if you pulled it from the side I gave you, uh, is the simplified body graph. And I am going to show the full body graph just to see how it works, just so you can see more into how do all of these different things come together. And when I say different things, we're talking about planetary placements, which is like ancient Vedic astrology, the I Ching, uh, the gates and channel system, the Kabbalah tree of life, with which are the chakras or the energy centers, which are what we're going to look at today. And it, I mean, that full body graph is really something to behold. It's truly beautiful, I think, um, at how it brings together so many different pieces of information and so simplifies our unique circuitry.
So this is the full body graph. Uh, I've already labeled planets because out of this whole picture, what you see here, the only thing that moves for us as individuals are the planets. So as the planets go around and we're coming in in our unique timing and location, that that is what changes and that that is our cosmic signature. So when we say cosmic signature, we mean the arrangement of the planets as you made your entry into your life. And so that's the piece that's moving and based on where those planets land is what activates the rest of this. So we'll start here on the right under planets. So based on where the planet lands, so this guy right here is Venus, um, he landed in gate six. So that means that gate six is activated and each gate you see lives inside one of the astrological signs. So those are the same, like if you're familiar with your natal chart, this wheel is the same wheel that you have in your natal chart and the planets land in the same spot um, as what you see in your natal chart. So again, that's how it kind of brings in the astrology piece. And then wrapped around the very outside of this wheel, these um, images on the very outside, those are the I Ching, hex <laughs> I Ching hexagrams. I am not familiar with I Ching a whole lot. Very, very high level superficial awareness of what it means. I have had one I Ching reading. It was extremely cool. And so I've heard some of those like hexagram descriptions and the predictive nature of them. And basically all of that is baked in, like you see here, for example, gate 22 has a specific associated hexagram. So that hexagram's description is baked into what gate 22 represents. And so that's kind of how that piece of it works. And then inside the body graph itself are the energy centers and or the chakras that they're modeled after. So the simplified body graph has just this piece right here. So this is where if you did get it from, get your chart from where I sent you on that site, this is what your chart looks like. And very first, to begin to understand the simplified body graph, we are going to differentiate between red and black. So you see red and black lines on your body graph. And on the left, there's a red column. And on the right, there is a black column. So these two lists are your planetary placements. And on the right, the black column called personality, those are the planetary placements from the date of your birth. And on the left, the design column, those are the planetary placements 88 days prior to your birth. So that's what the two different columns mean. And again, starting on the right, so the date of your birth, your personality is your conscious self. So as you study your chart, just know that any of those black lines or the personality placements, um, those are more like roads uh, that you can see on top of the ground. You can see that energy moving within you. You're aware of it. You know yourself to be that way. And then on the other side of it, the red side, that is our unconscious self or our subconscious self. So those are more like tunnels that exist under the ground and we use them to flow energy, albeit somewhat, excuse me, somewhat unknowingly uh, to ourselves. So that's something to be aware of. So as you read about those uh, design placements and those gates that are activated by those planetary placements 88 days prior to your birth, just know that those are tunnels. Those are gonna be subconscious traits within you that may or may not resonate as far as like you consciously understand that about yourself. If you've done a lot of work on self-awareness and understanding who you really are and your authentic self, then you probably will recognize these design uh, themes the same as you do your personality. So just keep that in mind. And I'm just going to say something else there. I'm sure it'll come back to me when it's right. So moving on here to dig into a little bit deeper, what is in these two columns? So we said they're the planetary placements. On the outside edge of each column is the symbols for the planets themselves. So again, if you're familiar with your natal chart, these are the same symbols. 
And the only one that you may or may not see in your natal chart, depending on how you cast your chart, is the second one, the circle with the cross in it. That is the symbol for Earth. So that is, it. it's a pretty big player here in your human design chart. And then the numbers next to each planet, those are the gates that were activated by where that planet landed. So if you go back to the full body graph, you know, here's Venus and it activated gate six. So when we look on that list on the other slide, when we look next to Venus, we'll see that it activated gate six. Um, so, okay. So centers, we've already said, those are where we generate our own energy and we flow that energy within ourselves. And it's also where we perceive energy. It's where, it's where and how we direct the flow of our energy. Gates and channels are two other words that you'll hear a lot in human design. This is how we are determining which, which centers are defined and which ones are open. So if you look between uh, or if you look at like the throat center here, for example, all of these numbers on the throat center are different gates that belong to the throat center. So again, we're in the territory of this is always defined like this. And the only thing that changes is where the planets were when we uh, were born. So everybody's throat center has these same gates on it. These gates serve as doorways, entry points into that energy center different opportunities for that energy center to be activated. And every single one of these gates by way of a channel is talking to a different energy center. So for example, this channel here, channel 45 to 21 connects the throat and the heart. Um, while this channel right here, 31 to seven, con uh, connects the throat center to the identity center. So those specific channels are always defined on the chart, same for everybody. And then based on where the planets were, that's which of the gates are now circled in purple. Those are the activated gates. And to define a channel, you have to have both ends of that channel activated. So for example, activated gates, that's where the planets are. Those are the purple ones. Defined channels are having both ends activated um, and defined centers mean that there are there's a complete channel between those two centers. So for example, this right here, in this particular human design chart, this is the only defined channel in the entire chart is this one between 12 and 22, gates 12 and 22. And you see that the whole channel is black and so we know that both ends of the channel, so gate 12 and gate 22, were both activated by planets on the date of birth. So they're both coming from that black side. And so here we see that it was the sun that activated gate 12 and that it's the north node that activates gate 22. And so because of that, this channel, gate 12 to 22, is defined. And because that channel is defined, the energy centers on both ends of it, the throat and the solar plexus, are also defined. So in this particular chart, all of these other centers are white because there's no continuous channel of energy between any of them. So for example, like you see here in the root center, these three gates are all activated. So they reach out, they generate energy but it's not going anywhere. It's not being received by the spleen, which is over here. I would need to have, or this chart would need to have these, one of these three centers, uh, one of these three gates activated in order to receive the energy that the root center is attempting to put out into the system. The root center is generating energy, but it isn't being received in the rest of the system in this particular chart. So, we're teaching, we're teaching you how to fish here. So what you would do with that is to Google channel 1222 human design. And I did that by just saying, this is a channel, this is defined, and I want the numbers on either end of it. Like I said, each of these channels is always the same. So for example, channel 1222 is the channel of openness. Um, another example, channel 20 to... 
channel 2034 is the channel of charisma. Um, so there's all of these different channels that exist that are ways that we all flow energy unique to us. And so you can research that entire channel and see, again, it's like reading about your life, um, see the challenges that you're likely to face and the, the tools for how to overcome that and make the most of that energy. You can also break it down even further to Google gate 12 human design and gate 22 human design. And in that sense, like when you read about gate 12, it's going to talk about the throat center because that's where it belongs. It's an entry into the throat, which is a manifestation center. We're going to get into all of that. When you read about gate 22, you're going to read about your solar plexus and your emotions, and it's going to put it into the perspective of that. And when you read about the channel as a whole, it's going to tell you how does the energy get generated in the motor, the solar plexus, that emotional energy travels to the throat and is spoken and is manifested. So that channel would explain to you how that happens. So it's so cool. Okay. So before we do our deep dive into each center, we're going to kind of break it down into just a few categories, the different types of centers. So like any circuitry, um, there's different parts that do different things. So for example, in your car, in your motor, there's the engine, there's the transmission, there's the starter, there's the battery, there's the, on, there's the fan that cools the engine. There's all of these different parts that come together to make a whole and make the whole thing function. So just like that, all of these different um, centers, all the shapes on the graph, they are each playing their own part. And if you wanna pause the video right here and just check out the little keywords that are on each um, center, that gives you a very basic rundown of what each part is. And we're gonna spend the rest of the session kind of going through those things in detail. So first up are the pressure centers. So this is where energy is generated in our circuitry. Um, this is where pressure is generated and the birthplace of stress. So there's two different kinds of stress there and pressure. There's the pressure to move and there's the pressure to find out. And we're gonna talk more about both of these in depth when we study the individual centers. There are three awareness centers. So this is where we're perceiving what's going on around us. Uh, each of them operates differently. The spleen is our um, existential awareness. It's our survival awareness, our safety, our physical safety. Uh, our Ajna, that top one, is our mental awareness. And then on the right is our solar plexus, and that is our emotional awareness or our broader awareness, um, also our intuition, where that comes from. Um, and awareness is driven by fear. So this is a really important point to keep in mind when we think about how these awareness centers operate, fear drives our desire to pay attention. Um, it is it is a very helpful survival instinct. So even though these awareness centers can, they are basically the, the home uh, where our fears are camped out at and that can run amok and that can get harmful and be in a low vibration where it hurts us to be carrying those fears. Um, but the desire to pay attention and the desire to be aware and take in that of information from your environment, it does protect us and the well-being of our physical vessel. Like I was reading on one of them, um, like in the times of the zombie apocalypse, you need your friend with the defined spleen who can like in a moment's notice just knows how to survive, just like can immediately put the pieces of the puzzle together, like take in all the information around you, problem solve on the spot. It's like MacGyver. MacGyver probably had a defined spleen, I would guess. Um, these are our survivalists. They know with instinctual accuracy what they need to do and when in order to protect their survival. So that is absolutely critical for the prolongment of the human race. So this is actually the oldest center, is that splenic center, that ability to protect our life. That is our most basic interior instinct that we have. And then you have our motor centers. So we have four motor centers, and these are the centers that actually create energy. Each of them creates a different kind of energy, and we're going to talk more about that when we get into each one. But just know that this is where energy is born in our system, the energy to actually be physical and get things done. 
The G center or the identity center is one of the centers for manifestation. Um, and we're gonna get really deep into both of those uh, centers for manifestation. And it's also where our self-love comes from, uh, or if we're looking to build our self-love, that's a good place to start is exploring the gates that are activated in our identity center. And then also it's where our life purpose comes from. So we're gonna talk about what the, what the ramifications are if you have that center defined versus open. Just like we're, we're gonna talk about that with all of them, but that one especially can be really hard before you master it, depending on how it works for you. The throat center is the manifestation center. So all of the energy in our entire system is working its way towards the throat. Like if you look at the body graph, everything about the circuitry is pointed in towards the throat because that is how you manifest something. And just to give you a very basic idea of why that is, if you're willing to say, I want, and finish that sentence and say, I want this thing, say it out loud, um, the chances of it manifesting in your life skyrocket. Because if you're not willing to say it out loud, that probably means that you don't actually believe that you can have it. Like you're not willing to say it out loud because by the time you get to the words part, you've already talked yourself out of, you don't deserve it. Maybe in the future, I can have it after I, you know, go back to school and I build up my resume. And once I get better, then maybe I can have it. But right now I can't really have it because I haven't done this and I haven't done this and I haven't done this. And the only reason that it's not manifesting is because of all that story you just told, talking yourself out of why you can't have it instead of just saying out loud, I want this. You know, our words are wishes. So when we say, I can't have it because I, you know, I don't have enough experience, I don't have enough skills, I don't have this, that's the universe saying, like, oh, okay, so you don't have, you don't have that. You can't have that. Okay, got it. And when you say, I want this, the universe is like, okay, here it is. That's why the throat center is the place of manifestation. It's where all of our beingness gets to this place of like the words that come out of our mouths are such an expression of who we truly are, who we truly are in any moment of our lives. And the words that we speak, sometimes it's even the thoughts that you think because that's where we're talking ourselves out of saying what we really want. Like, the universe feels all of that. And that is what is being responded to. So if you're telling a story about why you can't have all the things that you want, then that's what's manifesting around you. And if you, oh, if you're brave enough to say out loud, these, this is what my heart desires. This is what, this is what my intuition tells me I, I want to do. This is what I'm leaning towards. This is what I'm reaching for. I want this. I want this thing. Pathways open so that you can have the thing. We can all have the thing, whatever we want. And we'll get into, you know, whether you have a defined throat center or not, you can still manifest the life that you want. It doesn't, you know, either way, again, it's just a matter of manifesting your unique energy. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a deep dive, which is still a shallow little deep dive because there's only one slide per, per center. And that's where, again, this is intended to set you up with enough awareness that you can go and do your own research. Um, and if you want help, email me, owningauthenticity at gmail.com, and I would be happy to provide pricing for a package of sessions. So before we do the deep dive, I want to add in this concept uh, around open centers. And remember, that's when you're not generating energy there for yourself. That's when you have it white on your chart. When the center is colored in and defined, that means that you are generating energy there and you're sending it out around you. That's in your aura. And open centers, they're not generating energy. So instead, they're taking energy in from the environment and they amplify it. This amplification of energy is where the power and the brilliance of an open center comes from. Uh, it's the idea that no matter what energy you expose yourself to, you will make it more. So if you expose yourself to an environment of abundance and luxury and well-being and peaceful living and happiness and self-respect mm -hmm. and respect and love for others and, you know, 
being of service to others and being empowered in your authentic self and vocalizing your deepest desires, you're exposing yourself to that environment, you are making it more, period. And the reason open centers can drive us crazy is because when we pick up a fear or we pick up a worrisome thought or we pick up the pressure that somebody else is feeling, um, that's where we are making that more as well. They, those open centers are amplifying whatever energy you're exposing yourself to. And so that's a really empowering thing to other, understand because again, if you want the life that you want, chances are you probably need to point yourself on purpose towards putting yourself in an environment that you would like to become more like. Okay. So here we start with the head center and we're just going to work our way down. Um, on each of these slides, we'll talk about the function of that center and uh, if it's open, kind of how to work through that. And then down at the very bottom, if you have the center defined, meaning if it's colored in on your chart, Google the channel that defines it for you. And if it's multiple channels that are defined between, um, then Google all of them. Like for example, the head center only has three gates. And so that means there's only three channels that can activate the head center. I think only something like 30% of people have a defined head center. And so that means that if your head center is defined, colored in on your chart, you can Google one of these three or whichever multiple ones are activated, um, colored in on your chart and understand for your defined energy, how is it that your energy flows? Because your head defined head center is gonna look very different depending on which of those three channels is activated for you because each channel has its own personality. Um, so, that's what to do if it's defined. And I'm gonna spend most of my time on these slides talking about what to do if it's open. Because open, like I said, it can be the, the source of madness. It can feel like taking in a million people's energies and having that bounce around your system and not knowing what to do about it. Um, but it's also the source of our, our unique brilliance and the ways that we can truly transcend and master our, our personal energetic circuitry. So, Without further ado, the deep dives on each center, the head center. Uh, its function is a pressure center. So it is the inspiration to find out. It's the inspiration to know. And I feel like with this one, I really need to talk about the head center and the Ajna center. So like you see, this is the second triangle. So those two are working together to create your mental experience. Um, and that I'm going to try to separate it and bring it together. So the head center is the inspiration. It's the pressure to think. It's the pressure to know something specific and important, important, quote unquote, because that's your own kind of subjective version of important. Um, it's also where if there's confusion that you sense, things don't make sense. So you want to figure them out. You want to get to the truth of something because you're sensing that this doesn't add up. There's something missing here. Um, there's doubtfulness. There's like the pressure to think because you doubt what you're experiencing. So you're trying to like get around it and see different viewpoints. Um, all of these pressures are giving you the question. Like I saw on one of the sites that the like picture the head center, like a giant question mark, like what questions are coming into the Ajna center is the second one. That's our thinking mind. So when you think about your thoughts and like your problem solving brain, that is your Ajna center, but the Ajna center all by itself, it's, it's like a lawnmower parked in the garage. You know, who's, whose yard do you want to mow? That's the, that's the function of the head center is deciding like which, which thoughts, which questions, um, which things do we wanna get to the bottom of? Which things do we care about figuring out? And then once we care about something, once we have a question, the Ajna Center kicks in and answers it for us. Um, so that is a pressure center. That's where, you know, that can be a stressful thought um, and this is something I want to kind of lay here in our groundwork for pressure centers in general, because we'll come back to it when we get to the root. Um, pressure and excitement 
can feel very similar uh, when you're not really used to it. You know, like there's there's excitement that can pull you forward in a very similar way to pressure can push you forward. So I think whether you have this center defined or open, play around with that in your awareness and see if, you know, pressure doesn't have to be inherently stressful. If you're allowing it to be translated as excitement and allowing that excitement to lead you in whatever it is that you're deciding to think about and get to the bottom of. Um, like I referenced the day I spent like nine hours, uh, digging into the rabbit hole of human design, that was very much a day of, I had to know, I had to know the more I knew, the more questions I had. And I just, I had to know, I had to keep going and everything I learned, there were just more questions and more questions and more questions. And it was like nine hours later. And my body was so full of excitement. I let myself be led forward in that excited energy for nine solid hours. And I woke up the next day feeling like, my body had been hit by a truck. Like I, I had held so much tension and that was really the first time I connected like that pressure slash excitement. Excitement feels really good. It's so exciting, obviously. Um, but it's still tension. It's still pressure that you're putting on yourself to know something uh, that you're excited to learn. So there's a lot of different ways to look at this pressure center. And so if you have the center open, meaning it's white on your chart, which 70% thereabouts of people have the center open because there's only three channels. So you got to have a planet land in one of these three gates. And you saw how many gates there are on the thing. I think it's 64 um, and only three of them get you uh, well. And I, technically you have to land a planet in one of the three gates of the head center and you have to land a planet in one in that corresponding gate of the Ajna center. So like the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm like, how does anybody even have the, the head and Ajna defined? My goodness, like that seems really hard to do, but somehow the universe lines it up. So, you know, if you have it defined, like I said, look into which of those channels is causing it to be defined for you to better understand your unique way of flowing that inspired thought and solving problems and getting to the bottom of things. There will be more information in the channel for you. If you have it open, uh, the potential, and we're always going to talk about potential with open centers, because like I said, these are so chaotic because you're soaking up energy. If you don't realize you're doing that, it leads to chaos. I'm sure you can resonate with that um, if you have any open centers in your chart, which most people do. And with practice, with study of the self, the art of studying self, um, we have potential with each of these centers. And throughout our lives. And as we work to increase our happiness, chances are we are without even really knowing what we're doing, we're practicing mastering our open centers. So that's why I say like, when you read about these things, it feels like you're reading the story of your life because yes, I resonate with all of these things, all of these chaotic things that used to happen. And then your tools for like, how do I get better at this? Yes. Those are the things I've been practicing and you're right. I do feel better now. So when you have an open center, there's always potential there. And with that potential, I like to think about it like there's no top end to that potential, meaning you can get better and better and better and better and better and better and better. There's no top end, no top end to how good you can get at mastering that energy and thus how good you can feel inside your unique circuitry. So some food for thought on how endless it truly is. So with the head center, the potential is that you can get really comfortable with the unknown. Like you can enjoy a question because you know that the answer is coming. Like as soon as you see a question, as soon as you feel the pressure to know something or the inspired, like random wondering that now you got to open Google and like how many times a day does blah, blah, blah happen? Like I don't, whatever, like this inspired question, you learn to witness that 
the question automatically puts pressure on us to answer it. That's the whole point of this pressure center. But you can experience it as excitement because you know that when you're inspired with a question, the answer is on its way. It's only a matter of time before I know the answer to this question. So when you see something that's unknown, it's only a matter of time before you're going to know it. So that's why I say open to unknowable things. Um, when you have your thinking and your inspiration mind open, basically anything and everything can come into it. So that is a very free flowing place to be and can lead to things that, you know, someone with a defined couple centers up top, they are masters at what they do, but in terms of innovation and stepping outside the box, um, that's not where that kind of thinking really comes from. And again, there's no right or wrong. It's just a matter of understanding your unique circuitry. Um, again, with Open Center, you have the potential to explore endless viewpoints. And like we've talked about with this buffet, you try on each viewpoint and you're able to say, oh yeah, this one fits nice, I'm gonna keep it. Or, ooh, this doesn't fit, I'm not keeping this. Um, yeah, so that's really cool that you can expand your perspective by soaking up little pieces of your environment's perspective and only keeping the ones that really truly serve you um, and letting go of the rest of it. So the questions on each of these slides are to help unpack that not self behavior. Like if you have this center open, this is what it's going to look like when it's malfunctioning, when there's balancing work needed in this particular area. So some questions to ask yourself if you're feeling, especially if you're feeling that mental pressure, that your mind is racing and I need to know, I need to get to the bottom of this, I need to make a decision, I need to, you know, like that kind of pressure. Ask yourself, does what you're actually, what you're thinking about actually matter in your life? Like, is this your thought? Is this your worry? Is this your problem to solve? Or is this, like I find myself a lot of times <laughs> like thinking about society's problems and those big picture things. And again, that's all well and good if I've put myself in a situation where that's my work and that's what I'm here to do. Like I'm some politician, like crafting policies for the whole, but I'm not, I didn't put myself in that perspective. So really like spending a whole lot of time thinking about the problems of the world and how do I solve them? Maybe it's fun. Maybe there's a little bit of fun in that, but a lot of times like it just ends up in this place of like, this is so much bigger than I am. And that's not very satisfying. Um, so does that really matter in my life? Like, is this something that I'm facing in my right here and now? Um, are my worries mine or somebody else's? So if we have an open head center, that's that mental pressure. And we're more likely to pick up or we are likely to pick up the mental pressure that others are feeling. So that is a good question at the end of the day. Like if you feel again, like your head is full and you're just like so tense and can't relax, are these my worries? Are, am I holding on to worries that don't even belong to me? Um, and if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel like your brain is too full, especially if you have an open center, chances are you're holding on to things that don't belong to you. So working to let that go, like we talked about, like if, you, if you're a sponge, if you have an open center that's acting like a sponge, you have to wring out the sponge every once in a while. Um, otherwise, it just, it, it wreaks chaos in our world. It truly does. So we've already talked just a little bit about the Ajna Center. It's the second one that makes up our head, our thinking experience, our mental experience. The function with the Ajna though is conceptualization, like basically problem solving. So when we think about thinking in our brain, we're in our Ajna Center because by the time we have a question, you know, like we said, think about that top head center as a giant question mark. These are the specific questions that we want to answer. By the time we have a question, typically we don't even realize that like almost immediately our Ajna kicks in and starts like brainstorming and problem solving and coming up with like different ways to look at it. And how can I put these pieces together? And how can I make a formula for success and put the puzzle together and make it work more efficiently? All of that is happening in the Ajna and all the Ajna needs is a tiny little bit of mental pressure and it's off and running. So that's where we have to beware of 
whose mental pressure is making my mind race like this? Is it mine? Or is it something that I picked up along my path today that maybe I should, I should do an emptying out like body scan meditation or something like that to wring out my sponge, whatever helps me to clear out my system. So when it's open, uh, which like we said, only 30% of people have their head center defined. I think a little bit more have their Ajna center defined because with the Ajna, you can have it defined by your head, that mental pressure coming in. Um, you can also have it be defined to your throat. So there's three more channels down here coming off of the Ajna connecting to the throat center where maybe those are the two that are connected. So it's possible to have Ajna defined, but not your head. Um, because your throat would be defined in that case. So that is possible as well. And either way, uh, with the Ajna, like if it's open, then it's, um, basically that's your thinking mind. So your problem solving mind is open and flexible and inconsistent. And that means that when you face a wide variety of problem, basically any problem, you just kind of open up and like the vastness of any and all problem solving abilities are at your disposal. If you have a defined Ajna, meaning it's colored in on your chart, that just means that you have a set method for problem solving. And chances are you are going to be an expert at solving problems with that method. And the drawback may be inflexibility in terms of if you face a problem that requires a solution that isn't in your wheelhouse, you likely won't be very good at solving that problem. So again, no right or wrong, just an understanding of, of your own energetic circuitry. And just like every single center, you know, that same note down there at the bottom, if you have that center defined on your chart, look into the channels that are making it so and understand how you are flowing energy through your system. Um, the potential with the open center is to absorb information extremely quickly because you have such a flexible way of putting the pieces together. Um, I loved this part that open Ajna centers are more attached to wonder and curiosity than being right. Again, because it's open-ended and undefined and like those open centers at the top, they really just love a good mystery. They love to think and problem solve just for the sake of thinking and problem solving. Like even if nothing ever comes from it, it's just fun to do. And again, the wisdom is potential for truly organic problem solving, meaning that you're allowing the free flow of thought. So again, if you have that center defined, you have a set method for solving the problem. And if it's open or white on your chart, you just like come up with solutions. You just pull them out of the air and other people are looking on like, how did you put that together? How did you come up with that? So there's a really um, wonderful ability to be creative with solving problems. But again, same as the head center, if you, there's pressure in your head, if there's racing in your head, beware that you haven't picked up energies from someone else that that doesn't actually belong to you. And with an open Ajna, a question to ask yourself is, do you beat up on yourself for uh, having an unruly attention span? Meaning your brain seems to just hop around from like one thing to the next. And there doesn't always have to be a whole lot of logic between topics. And like, you'll lo lose your train of thought. You'll like be in the middle of doing something and then all of a sudden get this idea that you need to go do something else like it's a free flow it's a free for all it's like a cluster of thoughts uh happening inside your brain and that's where we say like truly organic problem solving because there is no logic there is no sense to it really as one step flows into the next is the solution built but by the time you get to the end the entire solution is utterly brilliant but you can't understand it as you go because it doesn't make any sense in it's pieces. It's like that. It's like genius, like, like a whole nother level of what you're able to do when you're able to clear out your mind and let that open space just present the solution to you. So again, it's about learning how to work with your energy in the way that it's wired. So the throat center is the manifestation center, like we talked about, and all of the energy in the circuitry is trying to reach this throat so that it can come out and be manifested um, in the physical. And so if you have an open throat center, 
mind, mind you, this is not the only manifestation center. We also have our identity center, which we're going to talk about next. Um, but with an open throat, that doesn't mean that you don't manifest or that you can't manifest the life that you want. It just means that your style for manifesting is different than if you have a defined throat. Um, so if it's open, the potential is for a very open and sensitive communication system, meaning you can be gentle and compassionate and talk with a wide variety of people, basically anyone, um, and that they will feel heard and they'll like you, basically, is what that sensitive communication system means to me. Uh, it also has truth detecting ears, meaning you can hear the truth in what people say and you can feel what's not being said. Like you can actually, you actually feel like you can hear what's being left out. Um, and that potential is also to learn to trust your aura to speak for you with the open throat. Like you, I mean, I think about um, my girlfriend, uh, the very first time that I saw her, she walked in and there was just something about her. And now I call that an aura, right? Like her presence was so captivating. And she said like two words the whole time she was there. And I was totally intrigued. So it's like that. It's like letting, letting your very energy speak for you, just embodying who you are instead of needing to put a million words to it. Um, these people also have the potential to luxuriate in silence, uh, unlike in a defined throat where words are just their life, their breath, their, you know, you need that. Uh, an open throat center can communicate without words more effectively. Eventually, this is their potential, right? Um, and they do that by waiting for the right moment and the thought to speak itself, basically. Like, Either they have something that they feel like they need to say because this is this is something that they need to say, or they listen and they observe. And when you're in your not self, when you're when you're an open throat trying to live like a defined throat, the pressure of that can look like you feel obligated to fill silences and conversations. Um, you feel like you have a hard time controlling what actually comes out of your mouth, like the way you talk depends on who you're around. Um, there's something about the quality of your voice and even like your choice of words and speech change by the environment that you're in. Um, and that on some level, you think that if you were able to talk more or better, that you'd be more successful. So those are signs that your open throat center is out of whack. And if it's out of whack, again, that means that you're soaking up other people's ways of being and you're not working with your own circuitry, you're working against it. You're trying to copy somebody else instead of being your true authentic self. So that is an opportunity to master your own energy field as each of these centers are. So next we move on to the second manifestation center and that is our G or identity center. And this is said to be the seat of our soul. Um, it provides our direction in life and our love, our access to love, um, and that it acts in terms of being a manifestation center. The energy that we're embodying in this center, meaning our sense of direction and our love, it acts as a magnet to attract opportunities to us. So that's why it can be said to look like it's attracting fate but it's really not fate. It's really a reflection of the energy that we're embodying. So, you know, it looks like that on the surface though. So if this is open, I love how it says that, um, or one article said that if you have an open identity center, you're here to learn how to trust the universe, that really your key to success with your identity is learning how to put yourself in the right place at the right time, which is a sense of a feeling of knowing that you're in the right place. Um, and learning how to say where I am is who I am right now. And that's really empowering on a number of levels. One, you kind of let yourself off the hook for the fact that your identity evolves as you go. Um, that's kind of inherent in an open identity center and something that is going to be the case for the rest of your life. You'll find little pieces that you want to add and tweak and you'll get better and better and better um, at portraying who you really are as you go through your life. That's a blessing. Um, 
but it can be tempting to beat up on yourself for being inconsistent. So learning how to say where I am is who I am right now. The other reason that's empowering is because we understand on an even, even deeper level that like here more than anywhere else, we're taking in and amplifying the identity of the environment we're exposing ourselves to. So if you don't, this is where it says trust and admire your environment because it's your identity. So if you do not trust your environment, if you do not respect it, uh, you don't like it, you think they're doing it wrong, you should leave because you're becoming more and more and more like them the longer you stay there. So we reflect, we open identity centers. I put myself in that category because mine is open. Um, we reflect and amplify defined identities. And this is another piece of that superpower, the potential for superpower with an open identity center is that you can basically act as a mirror to other people with a defined identity center. You reflect back to them who they truly are. And that is a gift. That's a service that can help them become even clearer on who they truly are. And in doing so, we act as a chameleon. The Open Identity Center is like a chameleon where we try on different identities, we speak in different ways, we use different words. And all the while, we're on some level taking notes of like which pieces fit who we truly are and which pieces don't. So, to, the questions to ask yourself if you're feeling a lack of sense of direction or a lack of self-love, um, do you find yourself shifting identities over time like a chameleon? Are you extra sensitive to your environment and the way that it makes you feel? And this one, um, it said that this, this center more than other centers is extremely sensitive to their environment because like the key for an open identity center is to be at the right place at the right time. So if you feel uncomfortable in your environment at all, you are not in the right place at the right time. That's the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and all that can come from that are lessons and tests. So if you want blessings, if you want soul level fulfillment, we need to be walking on the path of right place, right time. That's how those opportunities present themselves. And to do that, we need to feel good in our right here, right now. And so that's where the sensitivity to our environment comes from. So learning how to listen to that and learning how to respect yourself. If you feel uncomfortable in an environment, don't go there. Don't go there. No matter if everybody else is going there and they don't understand why you're not going there, you can go there and you can feel miserable the whole time, but just know you're going to bring that home with you and you better have a way to wring out the sponge. Otherwise now you're holding on to it. Um, or you could just not go there and just don't soak it up in the first place. So it's an empowering thought, you know, maybe I just won't go to that thing that makes me feel really uncomfortable every time I'm there. So, you know, something to keep in mind. With this one, because it's also a manifestation center, I wanted to add this in that I found from one of the articles. And this comes from Abundance by Design, which is a book on Amazon. So if you're interested in looking more into that, um, you can just search that title on Amazon and find that. Uh, but basically, it puts forward that there are eight energies that determine our level of abundance. And abundance is something that I feel like is everybody's out there looking for abundance. So this is cool. Um, and I've also been going back and forth a lot lately between the idea, well, really around the idea of true abundance, true wealth. What does that really mean? Because I've made money and I can tell you that's not true wealth because it can still be very empty. It can still be very unfulfilling to make a big bunch of money. Um, and at this point, I'm looking for a job or work that pays me more than money because I'm understanding that true wealth exists on a different dynamic. And so these things, I think, truly embody what I've been calling spiritual wealth or true wealth. What I'm sensing is true wealth. Um, and real quick, they are self-love, personal empowerment, alignment with our authentic self. And really that's deceptive because in order to align with our authentic self, we have to know who our authentic self is, which is a whole different process. Um, number four is how we've internalized past lessons. That's deep. That's got shadow work written all over it. Number five is alignment with spirit, the universe, and higher power. 
Number six is embodiment and body image. Do you love your body? Do you love the way it looks? Do you love the way it feels? Do you, are you fighting against your body or are you working with your body? So all of that has to do with abundance. Um, number seven, the capacity to allow and receive. Um, that one, I, I wonder if that doesn't trip up a lot of people. So many people in this world are so eager to give and to be of service, and then they suck at receiving. Uh, myself would be the, used to be the president of that club, and was just very uncomfortable with compliments, with gifts, with any amount of anyone showing me love because I was so uncomfortable with being loved, which is a sad story for another day. Um, but it's so true that if you don't have an ability to receive, the universe could be showering abundance all around you and you've got your umbrella up and now it's missing you. And so that's an inability to receive. So learning to put the umbrella down and receive the blessings and the abundance that's already flowing to us. Yeah, I can definitely see how that has something to do with our level of abundance. And number eight, service to the greater good. And I think that's trying to get at the intentions and the motives of what we're doing. Um, you know, like we can make a lot of money by taking advantage of people, or you could make a lot of money because you invent something that serves humanity. And now you sold a billion of them and you made a lot of money because you were helping humanity. So which of those is a truer level of abundance? One of them could potentially haunt you and will for sure cause you to rack up some bad karma that your soul is going to have to pay off. The other is, is a fulfilling soul level type of abundance, knowing that you've done good. You've done good and you've positively impacted lives around the planet. So there's, it matters, the intentions that we bring to things. Next, we'll move into the heart center. So that's the little triangle there at the center. And the function here, this is the base of our ego. This is where our willpower and commitment come from. And this is also our self-esteem. And our self-esteem is tied into all of these things because our self-esteem is basically a score on how good we are following through with our word. And this is the tricky bit for an open heart center. And you see here, I've specifically said, this is the majority. The majority of people have an open heart center. So I'm talking to the majority of people right now. When I say that, like, if you can't keep your commitments, it hurts your self-esteem. So that means with an open heart center, you don't have access to that energy, that egoic energy on a regular basis. You're soaking up egoic energy from people around you. And when you do that, uh, you're amplifying that egoic energy and you have a potential to get stuck trying to live up to somebody else's ego instead of operating on your own inner truth. And so this heart center is probably one of the ones I saw that's like the most, it really depends. If you have a heart center that's defined, then you are very well served by following your egoic desires. And really most likely the entire universe is served by you following your egoic desires. And for most people without a defined heart center with it open, they are better served to release their ego as much as they possibly can, um, to let that be open and a free flowing moment to moment experience of the world and less a defined egoic image of themselves. And this, the chaos that can come from this early on is trying to live up to your promises that you made that like, People make promises all the time. Like, what's so wrong with that? Like, you know, I think about how I have this center open as well. And it makes me think about my, uh, my engagement. I said, yes, I would marry him. And then as it got closer and closer and closer, I was like, I can't do this. I can't. I like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> and it took me a long time to figure that out because he wanted to get married. And I was soaking up his energy. I know it for a fact. And I said, yes, because like, okay, that sounds good. And then as it really came to pass, like I had to cancel that wedding. I didn't go through with it because I just can't. And so every time you go back on your promise, you risk injuring your self-esteem. 
until potentially you've broken so many promises that you have no self-esteem and you think you're worthless because you can't even keep a promise. Well, how about this? <laughs> this is something that felt like such delicious medicine to my soul. And I'm so excited to share it with you. Um, this little protective bit down here at the end of the open description is that with your heart open, you can only stick to what is meant for you. Any promise you've ever broken was because you shouldn't have made that promise in the first place. It wasn't meant for you. You promised something that wasn't true to who you are. And in the long run, you figured out that that's not true to who you are. And you quit that or you gave it up or you went a different direction. You changed your mind, whatever. Um, so that's a nice thought that like, you're not just randomly flaky. You're not just randomly, you know, trying to hurt people by backing out of commitments that you made. It really is a protective measure of the universe that you cannot stay with things that aren't meant for you. So looking at it with that slightly different perspective, it becomes a matter of like <laughs> an open heart center. Don't make promises in the first place. You know, like, you know, you can't keep them. You know that in only the only thing that's going to show you if something is meant for you or not, it's time. And making a promise right now, you don't know. You don't know what time is going to reveal in terms of who you are and, you know, the greater clarity behind your authentic self. So watch the promises. Just don't make them in the first place. And trust that if something is truly meant for you, that the willpower to stick to that commitment will be organic and it will naturally flow through you because that's what you're meant to do. That's your authentic self. It'll be easy to stick with it if it's meant for you. So I feel like that made me feel a whole lot better. Uh, the questions, do you often wonder if you're good enough or if you're doing things because you're not yet good enough? Um, do you beat up on yourself for not being able to stick with plans? Like you make a diet and then you're like two days later and you're stuffing your face full of Reese's peanut butter cups um, or relationships or whatever. Like I'm 33 years old. My longest relationship ever was three years because I mean, that's about the longest my identity stays in one place before it evolves. So, and I always like, oh my goodness, I would beat up on myself so much for not being able to like hold down a relationship. Um, but I, al I also was aware that like every time I, you know, leave this relationship and be single for a while and then get into a new relationship, it's always a better relationship than the last one. So letting that evolution happen, I am getting closer and closer and closer to who I truly am and what is a reflection of my authentic self. And so it just takes a little bit of trial and error and a lot of flaky evolution, you know, non-attached evolution of through that trial and error, you can try on something, you can make a commitment to try it on to see if it fits you. And if you find out it doesn't, you have to leave it behind. Basically the deciding factor of how that's going to go for you is how do you feel about it? You know, like, are you beating up on yourself because there's another commitment I broke or are you realizing, well, that wasn't right for me. Good. Okay. So we're back to a clean slate and now I'm more likely to attract something that is more right for me. So again, it's just a matter of how you treat yourself along that process. And the open ego, it seems like a really defining factor that you see over and over again is the need to prove yourself to others because you don't trust that you're inherently good enough. So you want somebody else to tell you that you're good enough um, and doing a good job. So that's something to watch for. And when you want that external validation, know that that's an opportunity to turn inwards and practice your self-love, practice appreciating yourself. Okay, so the sacral center, this is that one center that if it's activated, that makes you a generator. So this is kind of that deeper dive into this energy that makes generators generators. Um, they are called that because that sacral center literally generates life force energy. It is where our sexuality comes from. It is, um, it produces physical energy every single day. 
And if you have this center defined, one of the keys for success is that every day you need to exhaust your physical energy. So like, again, I think, of, I think about my girlfriend, she has this one defined and she, even on her days off, she's out there weeding in the grass weeding in the yard. She's laying rock by her sidewalk. She's like planting these flowers. She's mowing, she's building something. She's, she is constantly on the go. It is very rare for her to take like a true rest day because she has physical energy to burn. And it says, if you have your sacral center defined, that's really the best course of action for you is to be active and burn that energy off every single day, like empty out your gas tank every single day. And you'll sleep better when you go to bed if you do. Um, so this, this sacral energy, uh, it's our inner gut knowing constantly responding to your now moment. That's an interesting, um, interesting distinction because again, it's one of those that like, doesn't really repeat itself. It's like a knowing in the now moment. And if you're not paying attention to that, then you're missing out on the benefits of what it's telling you. Um, so if it's open, if you have that center white on your chart, then you're here to learn the art of pacing and learn how to discern when enough is enough for you personally. Um, if you have this center open, chances are you've experienced a lot of burnout in your life, trying to live and operate the same way that other people do. If you don't have that center defined, if it's open in your chart, that means that that like literal physical life force energy, you don't produce that period. So if you happen to find some, make the most of it. And if you don't have any right now, then experience the blissful peace that comes from this restful state. You know, like I, I genuinely believe that an open sacral center, we are here to master rest and restful regeneration. The difference between putting yourself into bed and fretting and having anxiety and just like tossing and turning and worrying about everything versus like truly allowing your body to relax and to rest, to like, let yourself find stillness. Um, you know, the, the first one, you're not actually resting. The second one, you are actually resting. And the more you're rested, the more chances of allowing the physical energy that you do have to turn into you doing something, being active, making progress, all of these things. Um, if you have the sacral center open, and this one has been huge for me personally, uh, take time to wind down before sleep, AKA go to bed before you're tired. And this, like, this is how you sleep better if you have an open sacral. So if you have a defined sacral, go to bed when you're exhausted. If you have an open sacral, go to bed when it's time to go to bed. Don't wait until you're exhausted because chances are it'll be four o'clock in the morning and you'll still be like totally wired. And now you can't sleep because you were engaged doing other things. And again, that open safe role is like, we don't have, I think about it, like the governor that exists on like some trucks where you can't go faster than a certain speed limit, or you can't accelerate faster than a certain pace. Like when you have a defined sacral, you have a connection to your own physical energy and you can feel when you've spent all your physical energy and you're done now and you sit down and fall asleep. And when you have an open sacral, you have no limit as far as like how far you can go before you stop. And that doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. You know, like just because you can keep going doesn't mean that you should. And that at a certain point, you are doing damage to yourself, to your system, because you're overextending your system. You're working on energy that you don't actually have because you can't sense that you're, you've depleted your energy sources. So that's why all of this is like learning how to allow your cycles of energy. And the thing is like some days the cycle is in a rest period. And that means that when you don't have the physical energy to go, then you don't go. And that's where modern society isn't built for people who have an open sacral. You can't call into work and say, sorry, my sacral doesn't have any energy today, so I'll be staying home. I may or may not see you tomorrow. That's unacceptable. And 
you know, I have seven open centers in my chart and my energy is extremely up and down. It's, it comes in waves and the waves are super tall and the lows are super low and holding down a Monday to Friday, eight to six kind of job was almost impossible for me to do because having to be that consistently energetic, it was like killing me in the, in the very long run. Like it was sucking the life out of my system. And now where I have seven days a week free to wake up and go with my own pace and do what I feel like doing and be productive on the days when I have the energy to be productive. And on the days when I don't, I rest and I don't try to say Saturday, Sunday are for rest and Monday to Friday are being or for being productive, I let the energy come in whatever spurts it's willing to come. And when it's present, I capture it and I make the most of it. And when it's not, I go tuck myself into bed and I do something special and nice and cozy and cuddly for me. And I don't expect myself to work when I don't have the energy to work. So that is the, the mastery of the open sacral is to realize that forcing yourself to be consistent with your energy is not working with your system. Um, now, whether or not society is ready for people to work with that, uh, however it's built, that's a whole other question. And hopefully over time, you situate yourself into a life where you have the flexibility and the freedom to honor whatever energetic state you're in that day, where you have a job where if you wake up in the morning and your energy is super low, you don't have to show up to work that day. You know, like I'm, I'm basically a contractor, like a consultant. I have projects that I do in my own time. So if it's four o'clock in the morning, if it's midnight, if it's two in the afternoon on a Sunday, like, and that's when my energy strikes and I feel like creating, I do. And if it's, you know, all the times in between all of that, and I don't have the energy and I don't have the desire to create, then I don't. And letting that be the case has eased so much tension in my circuitry. Um, this is, this is why these open centers are so powerful and understanding where and how our energy comes from and where and how it flows through our body and how to work with ourselves when we maybe are lacking the energy that we feel like we need. Um, so the, the question here is, do you push yourself until you crash trying to keep up with how other people live? And if you have a lot of open centers, chances are you've experienced a good deal of burnout or depression or anxiety or something like that, because again, you're soaking up this energy from the outside and trying to live up to it when it, it's not all yours. You don't have to live up to anything that doesn't match your authentic self. So the splenic center, coming to the home stretch here, we've got three more to go. Uh, the splenic center is our survival awareness. So we talked a little bit about this on the awareness center slide. Uh, it's our basic instincts. And this is another one that is only talking to us in our now moment. And what that means is that if we, it's, a, it's basically a constant commentary on our now. So if you ignore that message, you're now getting a message about your now and you're now getting a message about your now. So if you're ignoring these messages that are coming from your spleen telling you you're in danger, something's not right, your well-being is being harmed, it's not going to keep pestering you with that. It's going to move on and it's going to continue to comment on your now moment. And if you keep ex exposing yourself to the same danger, it'll keep commenting. But whether or not you're listening to that or not is, is what's up for debate here, whether it's defined or not. The reason this one is so important is because it governs your immune system. So if there are fears in your awareness, if there are dangers present, if there are harmful things happening to your body and your spleen is trying to tell you like, hey, this is bad and we need to fix it, and you ignore that, then you're sick. Then you manifest uh, illness of some kind. And an illness in your system means you've ignored your energetic signals for long enough that now you have an illness in your system. And so that's where the spleen, it's, it's communicating to us with our basic instincts. And the more we can listen to that, the deeper our health will be. And that's the potential for an open center is to be deeply healthy because you learn how to interact with that fear, how to interact and discern is this my fear or is this somebody else's fear? Is this fear for my well being or is this somebody else that is fearing it for whatever reason and I've picked it up? Um, the, the body of an open spleen person is highly communicative. 
And that can be part of the chaos early on when you don't understand what's happening and you're soaking up energy from everybody else. Um, your body can be sending so many signals for well being that you wouldn't even know where to begin to process them all. It's just total chaos. Um, as you tune into your body and you get more familiar with your body, um, you are better at hearing and listening to and responding to the signals that your body is offering. And that is where the potential for deep health comes from. Every single time you honor the signal that your body sends you, you improve your overall health. So a lifetime of honoring your body's signals, and you have a deeply healthy vessel to live in. Um, and really with an open center, it's that much more important. Really, this could probably be true for any open center, but to master your personal daily self-care routine or ritual um, every single day, wring out the sponge, take an inventory, which of these energies are mine, which aren't. Um, and to master that means a lifetime of tuning. So as we, you know, as we start off in a chaotic space and we come to self-care and we start to feel better and as we feel better and better, maybe we can hear more signals and now we need more practices of self-care to answer to those signals. And once we feel even better, now we can hear more signals and now there's this other self-care that really responds to those signals. And it's a constant process of evolution of being able to hear your body that much more clearly and responding in whatever way feels like it's gonna honor those signals in their fullest form. So that's where we tune our self-care practice for the rest of our lives. There's no one size fits all. It's a matter of what do we need and what we need changes over time. So being open to that is kind of the key. The questions for unpacking, um, and this might be like, since the splenic center uh, guides our immune system, this might be if you're ill, if there's physical illnesses manifesting in your body anywhere, really, um, ask yourself these questions of, do I listen to my body and my body's needs? Am I often healthy or unhealthy? And I would say that spectrum of healthy to unhealthy, healthy is when we listen to our body's needs and unhealthy is when we don't. So if you feel like you're unhealthy on a regular basis, the answer, the tool for overcoming that is to tune into your body and increase your body awareness. Um, am I holding on to something that no longer serves me? Do I have a hard time letting go? This is something that like when you have an open spleen, just like when you have an open sacral center, you don't know how to say enough is enough. When you have an open spleen, you almost like have a really high pain tolerance, higher than is good for you. And you can hold on to things, especially toxic relationships long after they serve you. Um, you just don't want to leave because, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit painful, but it's fine. It's fine. It's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. Um, yes, it is. And you should have let it go a long time ago, but that that open spleen, it just doesn't, doesn't really know, like the sacral, it doesn't know when to say enough is enough. This is, this is not good for my well-being or my physical well-being. Um, do you leap into a decision out of fear? So like we said, the awareness centers are driven by fear. So if you have an overactive or an out of whack open splenic center, then you have so many fears of the unknown that you just like have to decide, you have to make things certain just so you can shut up the fear. It's like running rampant through your system. It's, it's leading the way at that point. And whether you want it to or not is up to you. And tuning into your body awareness is one way to kind of bring that overactive splenic center back down into a place of calm. So for me, uh, a daily yoga practice is really how I do this in terms of trying to go inward into an awareness of my body and what my body feels like. Okay. Uh, the solar plexus center. This is our emotional wave. And this is talking more about someone with a defined solar plexus center. They are on an emotional wave all the time. There's like the beginning of the wave and it comes up and then you're at the height of the wave and then the wave comes back down and then there's the low point of the wave and then the next wave starts and you go back up. So like that's what a, an emotional wave looks like. And if you have a defined solar plexus center, then you have an emotional wave moving through you all the time. And if you have an open solar plexus center, which is about half of people, uh, you're receiving the emotional waves of other people. 
So again, good to know if you're, if you have an open center and you like every time you spend time around that friend, you leave feeling really stressed out and really worried about stuff and really scared of stuff and like just really tense and all of that. Stop hanging out with that friend, right? You're soaking up their emotional energy. It doesn't feel good to you. So don't go there anymore. Um, and if you have a defined uh, solar plexus center, then it's a matter of learning how to use it and how to make the most of it, right? Like it's a motor center. So that means it's generating energy for us to get stuff done. And it is one of the ways that we find our willpower to like get out of bed in the morning and go do something. And if your emotional, if your solar plexus center is where you're getting your power from, then it's so important that your emotions are invested in what it is that you're doing. So this is a place where, um, like I have this center defined and it reminds me of the job I had before I became an entrepreneur where their values were not the same as mine. And it just like felt awful to have to go to work there every day. I didn't appreciate the company and the people were aligned differently than I was and going there every day. It just like hurt me physically. And eventually I quit that job, but that's why, because I, I have a defined solar plexus center. And so my emotional wave determines how I feel about things. And if I have to participate in activities that are outside of how I feel is right, it's a recipe for disaster. So being able to either, if you have a defined solar plexus, either be your own boss or work for someone whose values you really admire and are aligned with, that's kind of the recipe for success if it's defined. Um, when it's open, there's a potential for profound empathy as you take in and amplify the emotional waves of other people. And so that's why I say, if you are consistently hanging out with someone and they leave you feeling icky, then stop going there. And on the flip side of that, if you hang out with someone and every time you hang out with them, you walk away feeling like you're full of sunshine, keep hanging out with that person and you'll attract more people who feel like sunshine. And then you're attracting and amplifying more and more and more positive energy. And that's that mastery and that, you know, ultimate wisdom of an open center is that you amplify the energy that you choose to amplify. Um, these people with open solar plexus center are designed for calm. They don't generate their own emotional waves. They only are feeling and moving through the emotional waves of other people. So this is probably one of the more, I mean, with any open center, alone time is key. Like if you are, if you have open centers in your chart, you're taking in energy every time you're around someone, the only way to really get a handle on that is to know what your container feels like all by itself. And the only way to do that is to be physically alone. Because as soon as you're with somebody else, their energy and their aura is now inside your aura and you can feel what they're feeling. So that's what an open center does. So you have to be physically by yourself and just notice how does my container feel all by itself? And then, you know, like you, get into this place of calm, you get into this place of stillness and you can resonate with this is my true container. This is my true self. And then you go out into a crowd of people and you pick up this feeling of worry and panic and frustration and whatever else it is. And you're able to recognize this isn't mine. This isn't my emotion. My, my container is calm. So if I'm feeling this way right now, that means I've soaked something up from my environment and it's time to wring out the sponge. The questions here to unpack this, um, do you avoid conflict? Uh, and that would be because you're worried about hurting somebody else's feelings. Do you feel guilty when other people feel bad? Like you personally take it on that they feel bad and you feel guilty and you feel like you need to help them fix it. Uh, do you feel like your emotions have a life of their own and are often unexplainable? Uh, those are all signs that you are taking in somebody else's emotions and not being true to your authentic self. And so that's a sign that there's something that needs to be let go of. And all of this, again, in that, in that divine purpose of knowing and working with our unique circuitry. Okay, last one. 
uh, the root center. So it is a pressure center, like we talked about, it's also a motor center. So that means that it is both creating stress in our, in our systems, uh, that's the pressure part, and the motor part is that it's also responsible for the adrenals uh, or releasing adrenaline into our system. And that is because our body has its own mind, basically, uh, where if our body senses danger, our body produces adrenaline and our body is moving all before we've had a chance to really like even think about it consciously and respond. So that is, oh, that's, that's big. Um, that's big whether you have a defined center, a defined root or an undefined root because um, one of the quotes I saw that was so good was basically like, your body knows when it needs to be in movement. So let, like trust your mind, your body mind, uh, that it knows when it needs to be in movement. And if you're not in movement, then don't be in movement, then sit there and rest. Like if your body isn't moving, don't try to use your mental pressure, your mind pressure to force yourself to get up and move. If your body is still, let it be still. If your body is moving, trust that it knows that it needs to be moving right now. So there's there's a different way of looking at it, you know, like softening into so often we try to move our bodies with our thinking mind. And that's really not like, it's not sustainable to do it that way. And we can put unnecessary stress on ourselves in the process, which is not good for our, our health and overall well being. Um, so that's that's kind of the trick is like learn to trust that your body knows when to move and if it's not moving don't try to outthink it so the potential if you have this this root center open um the potential to become immune to the effects of stress and to find true peaceful living because you are recognizing stress for what it really is as a message and you can learn to discern between helpful stress and unhelpful stress um, and make the most of the helpful ones. You know, recognize when there's a stress present in your, in your aura, in your experience, and it's helping you. And then there's a stress present in your experience, and it is driving you crazy. <laughs> and it's, it's over something that you can't control. It's over something that's not your business. It's somebody else's deal. Like there's all kinds of ways that stress can get into our system and it doesn't actually belong to us when we have that open route. So, uh, like one perfect example, um, I have an open root center and I use, uh, events like scheduling live events to get myself to do things because without a hard deadline of some kind, I have such an immunity to stress that I'll just put things off and put things off and put things off and put things off like forever. And I need like a physical deadline, like a line in the sand where I can use that to motivate myself, to get myself to actually get into action and take action. And even so like I feel like my open root center is one of the main reasons that I, I'm always down to the deadline on things. And if anything, I like being down to the deadline because it's more exciting because I'm so immune to stress. And I so don't feel the effects of stress that, you know, being down to the deadline on something adds a little bit of excitement to my day. So, you know, if you're somebody that is always doing things like two weeks ahead of time, you probably have a defined route. If you're somebody that's down to the wire on every single thing that you ever accomplish, or, you know, you work well under pressure or whatever, um, that's probably somebody that has an open route and would benefit from creating their own structure of stress. Um, there's a book that I saw referenced called The Upside of Stress. I have not read it, but I intend to. It's definitely on my list because just like this, um, like using events to motivate myself, like I schedule an event on the nine centers and because I have it on the calendar, because I have people RSVP to show up, I make a presentation and I finish my research and I pull it all together so that I'm ready to make a coherent presentation in this, in this session. Um, and then once I have the content pulled together, I use it in lots of different ways. And 
but making the content in the beginning, I have to have this structure of stress or pressure, meaning a deadline, meaning the scheduled event where other people are going to show up. And so I use stress in a productive way to get myself to um, do something that I ultimately want to do anyway. I know that for my system, working without a deadline is not a great approach. I need a deadline to be able to motivate myself. So, um, and that is, that's now where I am now, where, like I said, I spend most of my time by myself. Um, I am, I don't go to a job outside of my home. So I am able to work at my own pace and only work when I feel like I have something productive to do. Um, so some questions for unpacking an overactive open route is, do you do everything fast, hurrying through your life? And I think about that, like it said, do you drive fast? Do you eat fast? Do you pee fast? Do you wash your hands fast? Are you constantly hurrying to like get out from under the pressure of what you're doing and like get on to the next thing? Um, do you feel like your day often turns into a pressure cooker more so when you're around other people? Like when you're by yourself, do you feel the effects of pressure or you know, is that only something that happens when you go to work or, or around your family or around other people in general? Do you regularly experience symptoms of burnout? And again, that one would be because with your open route, you don't have access to energy that you're creating on your own and you only have access to the energy of other people. And now you're trying to operate on the energy of other people and you're trying to live up to their energy levels and with an open route, you're not them. You're, this is another one where like you don't produce that energy yourself. So you have to take advantage of whatever wave of energy is moving through you. And if it isn't moving through you, if you're in a rest cycle in your energy stream, then it's time to rest. You know, I feel like open centers, that's one of the main pieces that's so empowering is that honoring and acknowledging the power of the rest cycle is huge. Um, the alone time is huge. Learning what your container feels like all by itself, that's huge for understanding when you're picking up the energies of other people. So yeah, that is all I have for you. I, I so thank you for tuning in to this space and soaking up this knowledge. I hope this helps you to get started in your human design journey and better understanding your unique circuitry. Uh, check out the description of this video for all of the links that I use to build this presentation and use those articles as a starting point. Uh, if you'd like to continue on your own research and if you'd like to contact me for help with your human design chart, you can reach out to me at owningauthenticity at gmail.com. Until next time, dear friends, I thank you so much for listening. You take such good care of yourselves and so will I.